this is one of these problems where you have to set up a system of equations. What we have is, and you know me by now, I'm a big fan of recording related numbers in a table. Uh, the relation here is a relation between n and Sn. So it says the sum of the first five terms is 65. That means S5 is 65. Uh, the sum of the first eight terms is 152. Once you, much, much like a lot of the math we do, you start off on a very bumpy, dark path. And you just have to take a few steps in one direction. You have to choose the right direction. And things start to clear up. So that's the whole goal in any of these problems. If you're having difficulty, you're trying to turn it into something that is simpler. And once we get over this first little bump in the road, it'll be fairly easy. This is the formula we're going to use. And normally what would happen is you would be given some information and you could load all of the numbers into that formula and solve the problem. The problem here, though, is what we would like to know, I think, well, I know, I think you understand this, is we would like to know those two things. Right? If you know those two things about this series or sequence, whatever you want to call it, you can solve the problem. That's got nothing to do with the table. Okay, the table is something different than that. I have to wait for my computer to catch up. There we go. And I'm going to load in the 5 and the 65. The 5 and the 65 are locked together. When you use n equals 5, you have to get Sn equals 65. So when I put them in here, I end up with 65 equals 5 over 2 times 2t1 plus 4d, right? If n is 5, when I put 5 in, n minus 1 will be 4, so it's 4d. If I were to do the same thing with my second, I want to call it a data point almost, my second ordered pair, when I put in 8 for n, I have to get 152. And the fact of the matter is now I have two equations with two unknowns, so it's a system of equations. And this is the first bump. We're, we're over this bump in the road. It's, it's looking now like we've got a strategy that's going to lead somewhere. And if I go a little bit further, I take that first equation, I'm just going to cover that up, be quicker. I take that first equation, and I multiply the 65 by 2, and then I divide the result by 5. Can you work out what I'm going to get? I think it's going to be 26. So another way to look at it is if I take that 65 and divide by 2.5 to get rid of that 5 over 2. 5 over 2 is 2.5. I'm going to get, did I say 26? And is it 26? So I get this equation, 26 equals 2t1 plus 4d. If I take 8 divided by 2, which is 4, and I divide that 4 into 152, I believe I get 36. No, 30, 38, okay, I get 38. So now I have 38 equals 2t1 plus 7d. And now, not only is the road kind of smoothed out, the sun's starting to shine on me. It's looking really, really doable because I can see that if I subtract those two equations, and by the way, I would subtract them in this order. That way my d's are going to be a positive number of d's when I subtract them. 
I subtract these equations and get 12 equals 3D. Not only has the sun come out, they're, hot, they're giving out free ice cream now. Like it's really simple at this point in time. Life is good. Because now I know that if I divide 12 by 3, I get 4. My subtraction's right, isn't it? Sure. I get D equals 4. And once I know D, I can just load that D back in wherever I like. I could put it in here and have 26 equals 2T1 plus 4 times 4. Not trying to minimize the work, but solving this equation for T1 is not a big deal. It shouldn't be at this point in your high school math career. 26 minus the 16 here gives you 10. Thank you. <laughs> Divided by 2 gives you 5. And I'm going to leave it here. I'm just going to say now that you know the difference is 4 and the first term is 5, I'm not even sure what the question is asking us to find, but you can find it now, right? You know the first term and the common difference. You could find anything. Um, somebody else had asked me about this question through email. And, and I don't mind going over this again, but I do want to point out to you that this might be the sixth or seventh time we've done a question like this where you're told two terms and you're asked to solve a problem with them. You could solve this equation, and again, if you know the first term and the common difference, then finding S25 should be like taking candy from a baby. It should be really simple and easy to do, okay? There's a simple way to do this without resorting to setting up a system of equations. And it's to say that to go from the second term to the fifth term involves three jumps in the sequence, which means to go from 40 to 121 involves adding three common differences. Um, To how many of you with a nod of the head or a raise of the hands, does that make sense without having to put the blanks down? Okay. If, if you're not in that group and you're wondering what exactly is going on, you might benefit from doing this. There's the first term, which we don't know. The second term is 40, then the third term, then the fourth term, then the fifth term, which is 121. Now you can see it's plus D, plus D, plus D. But that strategy is not going to be very helpful or practical if, you know, I tell you the third term has a number. Just one second. I tell you that the third term has a number. I'll fix that. And the 180th term has a value. You know, you're not going to want to draw out 180 blanks. Are you pointing out that I wrote 125 instead of 120? Yeah, thank you for catching that. And, wow, I'm just, uh, it's not even 120, is it? 121? Okay, so this is actually 121. Anyway, by, by solving that, which again is, I think, pretty simple, you're going to take 121 and subtract 40 and get 81, then divide 81 by 3 and get what I believe is 27. You will know the common difference is 27. We spoke about this yesterday. You also want to find the first term. You don't have to turn everything into an equation. You have the second term. Take away the common difference to get the first term, uh, 13. So now you know the first term is 13. The common difference is 27. Do whatever you need to do with the other equations to find S25. Uh, does anybody have any other questions you would like me to go over? Five B, okay. So you know the first term is negative six. This uh, this bit of business here, there's something that maybe you 
understand without even thinking about, but it's kind of complicated. When you're told SN is 75 and TN is 21, you can either just remember that when we say TN is 21, that this is the last term. But the understanding here is if SN is 75, that means it's the sum of N terms, whatever N is. N might be 12. But if you're finding S12 and N is 12, that means this is T12, which means it's the last term because there's 12 terms. It's not 12, or I don't know if it is or it isn't, okay? Um, but the bottom line is we have the last term, we have the first term, and we have the sum of the terms. The formula that will take you to your destination as quickly as possible is the one that Leonard Euler um, came up with, which is this one. Remember when we added the first term 1 plus the last term 100 when we were trying to add up all of the 100 natural numbers? And then we multiplied by half the number of terms. So what we can do here, Gabrielle, is just put in 75. And then in brackets, we can have negative 6 plus 21. Remember what I've told you, which is that, you know, that concept of simplification is something we do to make our jobs easier. Simple is more, it makes us, it's easier to work with math that's simpler than it is to work with math that is not simpler. So when I look at this, I say, well, can I simplify anything? Sure. Negative six plus 21 is 15. I mean, that's a lot simpler than writing negative six plus 21. And now what we're dealing with is this situation, n, is being multiplied by 15, and we're also dividing by 2. What that means is we have to unwrap all of that by multiplying by 2 and dividing by 15. Uh, you know, you could take 15 divided by 2 and get 7.5 and divide by 7.5, but in either case, you're going to get 10. Is that okay? All right. Let's move on now. We are looking now at... geometric sequences. And essentially everything that we have learned to do with arithmetic sequences and series, that is, find the 12th term of an arithmetic sequence, find the sum of six terms of an arithmetic series, all of these things that we've been doing with arithmetic sequences and series, we are now going to be doing with geometric sequences and series. Except geometric sequences and series don't have a common difference. If they did, they would be arithmetic. They have something different. So we're going to identify what geometric sequences are to begin with, determine the properties of those geometric sequences. Common ratio is to a geometric sequence what a common difference is to an arithmetic sequence. It's not the same thing, but what defines how you go from one term to another in arithmetic is what the common difference is. What defines how you go from one term to the next in geometric is what the common ratio is. When we did arithmetic sequences, we wrote general terms. Well, we're going to do that for geometric. And we also found arithmetic terms. We're going to find geometric terms. To begin with, the I was going to say the difference. I don't want to use the word difference here. For a geometric sequence, to go from one term to the next, you multiply by the same number. You don't add the same number. You multiply. So every term after the first term can be found by multiplying the previous term by a constant. So if I look at this sequence of numbers, 3, 6, 12, 24, I can see that what's happening is if I multiply the first term, which is 3, by 2, I get 6. If I multiply the second term, which is 6, by 2, I get 12. 
If I multiply the 12 by 2, which is the third term, 12 is the third term, I get the fourth term. So what's happening here is Give me one second. I guess we'll go with that. I thought I had made changes to this document, but I guess not. So the first term is 3. The second term is 2 times the first term. The third term is 2 times the second term. And the end result here is that I'm just showing this to you in a slightly different visual way. When you multiply the first term by 2, you get the second. When you multiply the second by two, you get the third. When you multiply the third by two, you get the fourth. Does that make sense to you? You with me on that? I, I want to talk about the power of geometric patterns, though, just for a second here. If you were to take a look at this sequence. Is that arithmetic or geometric? Nate? It's arithmetic. What's the common difference? One. Common difference is one. Uh, you know, I'm, I want to change this. Let's go three, five, seven. Is it still arithmetic? Okay, what's the common difference now? Two. two. Common difference is two. If I were to take a look at this one, And these both are going to go on. We've said this is arithmetic. This is geometric. I mean, I know you just learned about geometric less than a couple minutes ago, but you should see that it's not arithmetic. What's happening is we're multiplying by the same number regularly. And that number we're multiplying regularly is also 2, isn't it? Okay. Well, that number is going to be called the common ratio. But I have a question for you. There is, well, we're already into February. Let's say starting March 1st, January, February, March. There's 31 days in March. Okay. If I said that on the first day I was going to give you a penny, March 1st, you get one penny. And on the second, you get three pennies. And on the third, you get five pennies for every day of the month. I'd be giving you money. But then I said over here, you also have this option. I think it's pretty obvious that the second option will accumulate more money. I mean, you can already see it's starting to pile up in relation to that. I haven't, I haven't passed the five cent mark, but this is going to become eight, on and on and on. We could even work out, let's, let's work out a amount that you would get on the 31st of March here. Well, this is a math problem now. It's Tn equals the first term plus n minus 1 common differences. Well, the first term is 1. The first term, come on. For 31 days, the first term is 1 plus 31 minus 1 times the common difference, which was 2 cents. Can you work out what that is? I think it's going to be 61 cents. Big deal. Now, that's not the total you get throughout the month. That's just on the last day. So the amount that you would get on the 31st day with this arithmetic progression is 61 cents. How much would you get with this on the 31st day? Well, you don't have a formula for it. That formula that we just used only works for arithmetic. So we have to go to our calculator here. I take, and my calculator, I, I don't know quite how to describe 
why it does what it does here. But if you go 1 times 2 equals, and you do that a couple of times, then it learns. It, you have to do it at least twice for it to understand you want the pattern to continue. So 1 cent is the first day. 2 is the second. 4 is the third. This is the fourth day that you're looking at here. Would you agree? Fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth. On the tenth day, and, and I guarantee you, if any single person in the class agrees to give me this amount of money with this pattern for the month of March, I will give everybody in the room 100% for a final mark. I guarantee it. I'll quit my job the next day anyway. Because the amount of money is going to be so huge, I won't care. That's not true. I care about you. That's the, what did I say, 10th day? March 10th. March 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th, 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th, 20 On March 20th, if you agreed to this, you would be giving me, now this is pennies, You'd be giving me $5,242.88. That's the 20th day, right? 21, 22, 23, 24, 25. On the 25th day, you're going to be giving me over $167,000. Just on that day. 26, 27, 28, 29, 30... On the 31st day, you're going to be giving me over $10 million. This type of pattern, which we can call geometric sequences, we can call it geometric progression, we can call it geometric growth, is, it's also called exponential, is a type of growth that really takes off. When you look at what's happening with the arithmetic, it just follows a straight line pattern. When you look at what happens with geometric, even if it starts off low, it takes off very rapidly. When COVID first started happening and we didn't know what to do and nobody was wearing masks, that's what was happening. It was growing exponentially or geometrically. So the type of math involved with geometric progression is more complicated than with arithmetic. So in that example we were looking at, let me remind you what we were talking about. We were talking about this. That number two is called the common ratio. So we have the common difference, which we use for arithmetic, and the common ratio, which we use for geometric. We use D for a common difference and R for a common ratio. So what is the common ratio? It's what you multiply a term by to get to the next term. Or it's what you get if you take a term and divide by the one before. I, I want to go back and show you something here, again, by compares, comparing arithmetic and geometric. And I think this will be helpful for many of you in understanding the terminology and what's going on. Arithmetic, yes? Okay. What's the common difference? Six, right? Pretty simple. How many of you said that the common difference is six because you add six to two to get eight? Right? That's what most people will do. You say the common difference is what you add to move forward. Wait, add. Why are we using the word difference then? We use the word difference because if you take a term and subtract the one before, that's the difference. If I take a look at this, geometric, be sure, J, what's the common ratio? Four. four. I'm multiplying by four each time. 4 is the number you multiply by to move forward. Why is it called a ratio? 
because the ratio of 128 divided by 32 gives you 4. So a common difference is what you add to move forward, and it can be found by taking a term and subtracting the one before. A common ratio is what you multiply by to move forward, or it can be found by taking a term and dividing by the one before. I hope you're feeling better. So the common ratio, and you can look at your sequence right there. I think it was, is it um, 3, 6, 12, 24? Okay. If you take the second term divided by the first term, what do you get? Well, that's 6 divided by 3. You get 2. Okay. If you take the third term divided by the second term, look in, in your note package, that would be 12 divided by 6. You get 2. Take the fourth divided by the third, you're going to get two. In fact, without even looking at the rest of the se sequence, that would have to give you two as well, wouldn't it? And now we're back at this language that we've used before. If you take the tn plus one term and divide by the one before it, which is the tnth term, you're going to get the common ratio. All right. Uh, I'm going to tell you right now, it's... It's actually a good thing. You don't have the algebra skills to work with formulas very well if they're geometric. And the reason why that's kind of a good thing is because then we can do a lot of the work on our calculator. You will not learn the math needed to completely analyze these formulas we're going to be learning for geometric. You won't learn all of the algebra until math 30-1 because it involves something called a logarithm, which we can't get into here. But there's a general formula, and it says this. And I think it's valuable to understand why this formula is what it is. This says if you take the first term and you multiply by the common ratio raised to an exponent of one less than the term you're after, you will get that term you're after. Think about this for a second. If I have the first term, what is it I do to get the second term? Well, I multiply by r, don't I? So if I were to put 2 in here for n, I would be multiplying by r to the 1, which will take me to the second term. It's, it's analogous to, it's similar to, adding one fewer common differences to get to a term. Here we're multiplying by one fewer common ratios. So this is T2. How would I find T3? Well, I would have to multiply by the common ratio again. Be careful here. When I multiply by R twice, I'm not multiplying by 2r. I'm multiplying by r squared. Because r times r is r squared. It's not 2r. So I have to take the first term times r squared. Well, the formula works. The third term is n equals 3. So when I put 3 in here, I end up with this statement. I think it's valuable for you to understand where that equation comes from. Again, with arithmetic, you add one fewer common differences to get to a term. With geometric, you multiply by one fewer common ratios. So that's the formula. And it's called the general term, and it's also on your formula sheet. So when you look at your formula sheet, you have your three formulas for arithmetic, your general term formula, and your two sum formulas for the series. And then under geometric, it turns out we're going to have a total of four formulas. And we will get to all of them in the remainder of this unit. All right. Use the sequence shown above to create a general term, Tn, using that formula and verify that it works. So again, everybody, this is easier. 
The math is more complicated, but coming up with the formula is easier than arithmetic because all we do is put T1 and R in there. And that's it. Now, there are a number of ways to write this. I like putting the brackets around the 2 to the n minus 1, but you certainly don't need to. You could write it this way. You could write it this way. What is kind of missing when you look at your, you are familiar with bed mass, right? Brackets, exponents, division and multiplication, addition and subtraction. What's kind of missing here is this. But you should understand that when I have 2 raised to the n minus 1, I figure out what n minus 1 is and then I raise 2 to it. The most important feature of this, though, is that you do your exponents before you do multiplication. You're not going to take 3 times 2 and get 6 and then raise 6 to an exponent. You're going to take 2 raised to whatever n minus 1 is and then multiply by 3. So we want to verify that this works. We already know the sequence is, just double check here, 3, 6, 12, 24. Okay. So if I put 1 in here, what happens? I get 3 times 2 to the 1 minus 1. I don't normally like working left to right, but just for something like this, I think it's OK. We're just calculating a value. This is 3 times 2 to the 0. 2 to the 0 is 1. This is 3. Well, that computes. We, we're supposed to get 3. If I were to put in 2, how many of you, by the way, see why this is going to work? Not just for this term, but for any term. We get 3 times 2 to the 2 minus 1, which is 3 times 2 to the 1. 2 to the 1 is 2. 3 times 2 is 6. Again, it checks. And if you want to continue with that progression, you will discover that t3 will be 12, t4 will be 24. It works. Any questions with that formula? And again, this is just a warm up. All right, examples. Write the general term for the sequence. A and I'm going to be very demanding of you here in terms of how things are written. The first term is negative 10. And I would like everybody to determine what the common ratio is. I hope you're getting negative 2 for the common ratio. And if we stop and think for a second, and you know, the reason this works is negative 10 times negative 2 is positive 20. 20 times negative 2 is negative 40. Or you could take, say, negative 40 divided by 20 to get negative 2. But if we imagine an arithmetic, words are important in math. If I'm talking now about an arithmetic sequence, if the common difference was negative 10, or sorry, the common difference in an arithmetic was negative 2. The terms just keep getting smaller and smaller, don't they? If it's arithmetic. If it's a positive first term, it's going to get smaller and smaller until it becomes negative, And then it will become more and more negative as time goes on. What happens when you have this parameter for geometric, which we call the common ratio, if that's negative, then the terms flip back and forth between positive and negative. It doesn't just follow a, a pattern where maybe it goes up or down. It does this on a graph. It keeps flipping back and forth across the axis. So what is the general term? The general term is t sub n equals negative 10 times in brackets negative 2 
raised to the n minus 1. And, you know, I, I almost regret something that I wrote down a little earlier, and I'm going to go back to it. There's, it's not that I did anything wrong, but I want to go back and, and look at this and say all the ways that I said you could write this, which are these three here. I think you should get into the habit of writing it this way. I think maybe this is the best way to write it. None of those other ways are wrong, but if the common ratio is negative, you have to write it using the method that I've got in green. You need brackets around that negative. Okay? And we're going to just take a little break here. And I'm going to ask you to get your calculator out. And I have a problem for you. I'm going to talk about x and y. And, and I know that this function or equation I'm giving you is way beyond this course. But what I'm asking you to do is take different numbers for x. And I want you to take negative 2 raised to this value of x. So I want you to figure out what happens if you take negative 2 raised to the 1. And if you take negative 2 raised to the 2. And if you take negative 3, sorry, negative 2 raised to the 3. You're raising that negative 2 to 1, to 2, to 3, Let's go all the way up to 6. And this is going to seem like an odd request, but without using your table. Okay, please. And there is a reason for it that the algebra involved in the point I want to make is not going to be always inputable into your table. Okay? <laughs> I like what you've done there. I think it's, it's very quick as long as you've entered it correctly for y. So I hope everybody would agree that you get negative 2 here. And I don't think that anybody would have gotten this one wrong for 3. But some of you may have gotten this one wrong for 2. Did anybody, and be honest here, it's just us. Did anybody get negative 4? It's common. And you're not, you, you guys, the 2 or 3 that put your hands up, I know you're not the only one. Some of you probably didn't get 4. Uh, you probably got negative 4. If I do this, this is really important. If I go negative 2 raised to the 2, that's not right. The reason it's not right is I'm asked to find negative 2 in brackets raised to the 2. We say negative 2 quantity to the 2. And that means the whole thing is raised to the 2. This means negative 2 times negative 2, which is a positive result. When I enter in my calculator incorrectly for what I've asked you to do, when I enter this, what this actually means is this. That's what it means. It's like saying negative r squared. It means negative 1 times r squared. It's going to square that number and then multiply by negative. And the end result is that all of these are going to be positive and the other ones will be negative. Whoops. Uh, is this 64? And the reason you get a negative 
with these is because the exponent is odd. If I take a negative number and multiply that negative number out an odd number of times, I'm going to get negative. If I multiply it out an even number of times, this is what starts happening. Pairs of negatives start canceling and making positives. And that's a long five minute kind of discussion about this, but that's why, going back to this, I want you to get in the habit of putting that base of the power in brackets. Because it's necessary, not all of the time, but it's necessary if the base is negative. So that's the general term. And Okay, backing up. The beautiful thing about this is you're done. You don't have to simplify that. Remember with arithmetic, you got to start multiplying that d in and simplifying. There's nothing you can do here. All right. T sub n equals the first term multiplied by the common ratio to the n minus 1. Well, the first term is 64. What's the common ratio? Well, Figure out what you multiply 64 by to get 32. And if it's not obvious, take 32 and divide by 64. Take a term and divide by the one before it. And it's a half. I don't have a problem with you writing 0.5 there because 0.5 is a nice decimal. I hope you can appreciate why this is OK. We don't need brackets around the 0.5 here because it's positive. However, this is not OK because it looks like I'm just raising the 1 to the n minus 1. It looks like 1 to the n minus 1 divided by 2. If you're going to use a fraction, you do need the brackets. Uh, by the way, are all we asked to do here is write the general term for question one? That's it, eh? This is like, this is easy. Oh, here's a good one. T sub n equals T1 times R to the n minus 1. The first term is 3. The common ratio is 3. Yeah? Okay. We can simplify this. This simplifies to that. And this is almost a Math 30 idea, almost. We really do a lot of this in Math 30. By the way, can you confirm that 3 raised to the 1 gives you 3? And 3 raised to the 2 gives you 9? And 3 raised to the 3, it works, gives you 27. What have I done? to go from here to here algebraically. Does anybody know? Jay? Um, so because it's 3 times 3, that means you can treat that as an exponent, and you can get rid of this subtract 1. Right. This 3 is 3 to the 1. And when you multiply powers that have the same base, you add the exponents. There's already an extra 3 there. So you know, if I have x squared times x cubed, that's x to the 5. The base stays the same, and I add the exponents. So 3 to the 1 times 3 to the n minus 1, I add 1 and n minus 1 to get n. You're going to see that a lot in Math 30. More complicated, but it will be there. Find the indicated term. What's the ninth term? Well, listen, if this were arithmetic and I said find the ninth term, you'd write out the general term, then you'd put n equals 9 in. We're going to do the same thing here, but our general term, I'm going to write this up here, t sub n equals t1 r to the n minus 1. Well, tn equals 3 times negative 3 to the n minus 1. Would you agree the first term is 3? The common ratio is negative 3? OK. We just have to put 9 in here. And I would like everybody 
to figure out what that equals. It'd be quite a big number. I'm getting 19,683, and you have to get a positive. And if you want me to be perfectly honest with you, I know that 9 minus 1 is 8. I guess I should have put a 9 here, right? This is no longer Tn, this is T9, and I make that mistake frequently. Um, I get 3 times negative 3 to the 8. When I did this, I didn't even put the negative in in my calculator because I know it's raised to an even exponent, so why waste the time putting a negative there when I know the negative will go away? Okay, I just took 3 to the 8 times 3. And if I want to be really honest, I actually went 3 to the 9 because I recognize that 3 to the 8 times 3 is 3 to the 9. 19683. What is the seventh term of this? Now, what is 5 thirds? Check it out on your calculator. What is 5 thirds in decimal form? Is it a what I've traditionally called a nice decimal? No, it's a repeating decimal, but it's not a nice one because it repeats. So we're going to have to work with fractions here, but that's okay. The nth term will be the first term times the common ratio to the n minus 1. So what you need to figure out is what you multiply this by to get 5 6. And yes, you could use your calculator in a whole bunch of brackets, but I don't want you to. If every time we ran across fractions in this course, I just did it with you on the calculator, then when we get to algebraic fractions, you won't know what to do. And that whole unit is difficult enough already without the extra pressure. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm, I'm saying it becomes complicated. If you don't know the rules for fractions, you're toast. So what do I multiply 5 by to get 5? 1. What do I multiply 3 by to get 6? 2. Oh then I have to multiply 5 thirds by 1 half to get 5 sixths. So the common ratio is 1 half. Find T7. Well, we have to take 5 thirds times 1 over 2 in brackets raised to the 7 minus 1. And we're going to simplify T7 equals 5 over 3 times 1 half to the 6. Because 7 minus 1 is 6. You were taught. There's all kinds of variations of this rule. But when you have a fraction, and you're taught this in grade 9, and you're taught it again in grade 10, when you have a fractional base in a power, this whole thing is called a power. The a over b is the base. The n is the exponent. You were taught that you were allowed to do that. And the reason that works is because this means, well, I'm going to give you a specific example here. I know our exponent is 6 in the problem, but I'm going to say 4. This means a over b times a over b times a over b times a over b. But when you multiply fractions, you multiply across the top, and you multiply across the bottom. So what we're left with is a to the 4 over b to the 4. 
That's the rule that we have. This is called a power of a quotient. And that means that this becomes T sub 7 equals 5 times 3. I want you to notice that for the most part I have my fractions lined up. I'm a little bit scattered there, but they, they should be lined up. And then I'm going to have 1 to the 6. 1 to the 6 over 2 to the 6. And now I have a fraction times a fraction. So I multiply across the top and I multiply across the bottom. I'm going to have 5 times 1 to the 6 over 3 times 2 to the 6. I don't want to get into a detailed discussion here, but when we figure this out, it turns out you're not going to be able to reduce this fraction down any lower. And the reason is, the brief reason is, on the bottom we have factors of 3 and 2, and on the top we have factors of 5 and 1. There's nothing common that can cancel. And believe me, when we talk about canceling in this course, I'm going to be spending a lot of time explaining when we can cancel and when we can't. What do I get here? T sub 7 is 5 over 3 times 64, 192. Is that the right number on the bottom? Yeah. Now, could we have figured this out on the calculator? Yes, definitely. We could have taken in brackets 5 over 3. What I've told you about putting negatives in brackets, I'm going to tell you always do that with fractions. It's not always important, but it's often important. Times in bracket 1 divided by 2 n bracket raised to, well, my goodness, I wouldn't waste time entering bracket 7 minus 1. I would just put 6. You go equals, math, enter, enter. Yeah, 5 over 192, which is what we got. But if that's all you know how to do, you're toast later. Like I said, like really, you need to understand these rules for fractions. All right, find the general term and the indicated terms. Hmm. This is a problem we've done before. In fact, we did one, the homework question, number 10 on page 18 that we started off today with, where we had, it wasn't the third term is 4 and the seventh term is 64. I think it was the second term was maybe 6 and the fifth term was 121. I don't remember what the numbers were. But do you remember this setup? And what we said was, please don't write this down, this next part. What we said was that you have to take the, that 4 and add 4 common differences to get 64 because this is plus 4 and this is plus 4D. Remember, you know what I'm talking about here? Except that we're not adding common differences because it's not arithmetic, which is why I said don't write this down. What do we do to the third term? First, second, here's the third term fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, which is 64. What is it we do to the fourth term to get the seventh term? Yes. Um, multiply by R to the third? R to the No. no, not r to the third. I know why you're going one less, because you're remembering in the formula, I think it says n minus 1. We are not using the formula here. And that's interesting, because you might make that same mistake with the arithmetic. We simply count the leaps. 1, 2, 3, 4. We have to multiply by r four times, which means we have to multiply by r raised to an exponent of 4. 
If you look up here for a second, you subtract 1 when you go from the first term to the nth term. And we're not doing that here. We're going from the third term to the seventh term. We're going four places down the road. So that means, everybody, that 4 multiplied by r raised to 1, 2, 3, 4 has to give you 64. Now you solve that equation. I'm going to rewrite it down here where I have a bit more room. That term multiplied by the common ratio to the 4 is going to give us 64. So we divide in this equation by 4. And, and I'm going to be perfectly honest with you. You haven't solved this kind of equation before. Not formally. And what we end up with is r raised to the 4 equals 16. So does anybody have an idea of what to do next? EJ? EJ? No, we don't take the square root. Sorry. Yeah. I don't know the actual name, but like on the calculator, you have that thing that's like x and then the radical sign. Okay. You take the fourth root, and I'm going to show you how on the calculator in a second. You take the fourth root. If this was r squared equals, then you would take the square root. So what we need to do is take the fourth root. of both sides. And what I'm going to get is r equals the fourth root of 16. And before I show you the calculator method, the fourth root of 16 is the number that you raise to the 4 to get 16. I, I want to challenge you to think about that for a second. What number would you put in here to get 16. It's 2. 2 times 2 times 2 times 2. 2 times 2 is 4. 2 times 2 is 4. 4 times 4 is 16. 4 twos multiplied together give you 16. Now, that means that this is 2 on your calculator. I, I don't like the way this appears on the calculator. Um, if you go to the math menu, there's other things we can do to find it instead of doing this, but I think we'll stick with this for today. And you scroll down. That's exactly what you were talking about. It, it's the root with the x. If I choose that, I have, i got to go clear. I'm going to get an x with that root, but I need to enter the x first. So I go 4. I, I really hate how this looks. That, everybody is my calculator's way of saying that 4 is there. OK? And then I enter the 16, and I get 2. Now, if you have a different calculator, I just want to see. I'm not sure. My I don't use this other calculator often enough to know. Uh, well, that one, that one, well, that's a horrible one. That's not bad. It's a little, oh no, that's dead. Uh, let's do this one. There we go. Oh, I opened the same one. Boy, I'm scattered. Open. I want an 84. Well, we'll go with this one. I don't like the color of this one, but it'll work. If I do that here, I just want to see. Yeah, it, it, it puts the 4 in there. That's not where you would write it, I want to point out. You don't put the 4 way up there. You put it like, you just wedge it right in there, right in that little corner. Um, anyway, you get 2.
So the common ratio is 2. We can confirm something here, everybody. Go ahead and multiply 4 by 2. Multiply that by 2. Multiply that by 2. Does it give you 64 in the right place? Yes. Divide 4 by 2. Divide 4 by 2. As I've said, you've cracked the case wide open. You know the first term is 1 and the common ratio is 2. What were we asked? Well, we were asked to fill in the missing pieces, 4th, 5th, and 6th terms. One final observation here, and I don't want to spend a lot of time with it. I just want to point something out. Would a common ratio, that was our common ratio, would a common ratio of negative 2 work? Sure. 4 times negative 2 is negative 8, times negative 2 is 16, times negative 2 is negative 32, times negative 2 is 64. Which means there's an alternate answer here. And I am not going to explain why, but when you solve this equation, you actually end up with r equals 2 and r equals negative 2, which is going to be a huge part of this course when we talk about quadratics. But there's two answers. OK, let's take a look at the next question. What are the seventh and eighth terms? Well, first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth term is negative 5, seventh, eighth, ninth term is negative 1 over 25. Looking at those blanks, I would like everybody to figure out what exponent is on the R here. What do I multiply negative 5 by to get negative 1 over 25 in terms of common ratios? How many common ratios is it? Three. It's three. Excellent. So that means that that term raised, uh, multiplied by r cubed gives us the next term, t9. Um, I shouldn't have said the next term. Gives you the ninth term. I, I think many of you are starting to appreciate why it would be to the three, because to go from the sixth to the ninth is three jumps. So I need to divide both sides by negative 5. Now, again, fractions. The quickest way to divide both sides by negative 5 is to multiply both sides by negative 1 over 5. When I divide by 2, I multiply by a half. And now I can multiply across the top. I get 1. Across the bottom, I get 125. And it's positive because I have two negatives there. That is not r. That is r cubed, which means I need to take the cube root. I want to challenge you here without your calculator. This means the cube root of 1 over the cube root of 125. Cube root of 1 is 1. Cube root of 125 is the number that you cube to get 125. What number do you multiply by itself three times to get 125? Do you know? It's 5. So the answer is 1 fifth. The common ratio is 1 over 5. If you want to find these two terms, take negative 5 times 1 over 5. By the way, if I'm going to multiply by 1 over 5, I can just divide by 5 each time. If I divide this by 5, I get negative 1. If I divide negative 1 by 5, I get this. And if I divide that by 5, I get negative 1 over 125. 
So the two missing terms are negative 1 and negative 1 fifth. Was that the final example? It was. OK. So I don't, I, I'm not saying you can't use your calculator to do some of these calculations. But I'm saying don't be so lazy that that's all you always do. Try to get used to thinking of these numbers and trying to work out the results using rules of fractions and u using rules of exponents. You can see what the assignment is. As always, there's a whole raft of additional problems you could practice for extra practice. But the actual assignment is on page 39, questions 1 through 5.